John, welcome back to the show, my friend. We had we did a great interview last year, and um, a lot of people love the episode. So figured we'd get you back on a, literally about a year later, and uh, just kind of catch up and, and and see how your business has grown because it has. You've you know had a great uh, you know 2022 so far. You're doing a lot of things in your business. You obviously got a great team going on. So the theme of today's show, we're going to talk about you know what's kind of working in 2022 in your market. And really team building leadership stuff, because obviously, as you grow, uh, you know, you the leadership skills have to go follow or else it's going to fall off the track. So I've been going through that myself personally uh, with my team. So just, uh, you know, a lot of good stuff I see from you. I saw your uh, one of your Instagram posts, like randomly, like I just happened to see it on my feed. And I'm like, oh, man, this guy's got so much gold. I got to get it back on the show. This guy's just got so much to offer. So before we do that, like just catch everyone up if they didn't listen to the previous episode, like how did you get in real estate real quick? And then like, what, you know, what has your journey been like so far to where you're at today? Right. I appreciate you, man. Let me be, allow me back, be back on here. I appreciate that. That's an honor. Um, but yeah, so uh, back to my journey. I've been in real estate for about six years now. Um, before real estate, I was uh, with my family's business. Uh, it was a furniture retail store. Um, they have about seven locations now in Houston. They're just in local in Houston. Um, but I'm not talking about like those little rinky dick mom or pop shop there. It's like minimum 30 K square feet uh, for the retail stores. Warehouse is about um, 125, 150,000 square feet. So it's huge. It's, it's an empire. Um, so I was, I was with them for about seven, eight years while I was in high school and college. Um, but yeah, I got into real estate in 2016. When I graduated college, I just saw myself. I, I didn't see myself doing real estate. I mean, uh, furniture for the rest of my life. So I was like, this is something that I don't want to do. I don't want to be in the retail world, uh, working Memorial Day, Labor Day. I just, yeah, right. it was just too much overhead, you know, we got a bunch of customer service and it was just, it was just a little bit too much that I didn't see myself doing for the rest of my life. So decided to go ahead and um, look in, look, look something else, but um, got into real estate because mainly because uh, when I was with my family's company, I wore a lot of different hats. I wore, you know, I did accounts payable, accounts receivable. I did sales. Um, and sales was something that I, I thrived in and something I enjoyed. Um, long story short, I, my girlfriend at the time, she's my wife now, she was working for a, um, a new home sales rep. Got um, it. So new, new homes. And uh, she told me, she's like, hey, why don't you try to get into real estate? I mean, my boss clocked in about 600000 I was like, clocked in 600000 Selling homes? She's like, yeah. I was Good like, wood, bro. <laughs> yeah. I was like, done. Let's, let's go ahead and look into real estate. So been looking to real estate, I was looking to get my license, and, and um, you know, I just uh, fell into real estate investing. Uh, found Nick Ruiz. Well, he found me from Instagram ads, and that's how I got introduced to wholesaling. And from there, it was Nick Ruiz and Sean Terry was all I listened to in 2016, and that's kind of how my journey began. I love it, dude. Simple start, man. Nick Ruiz, is that guy still around? I haven't heard about that guy yeah, in years. Man. I used to follow him, but uh, I haven't heard from him in a while, but. He, he brought a lot of people up in the game. I mean, there's, there's people that, you know, are doing really big things now that they came up from him. So he's definitely a pioneer. Absolutely. Out in Wisconsin. So let's get right into it. So before we jump into some of the team stuff, we were just talking offline about, you know, marketing channels and, and, and what you do as a business owner to decide if you're going to keep a marketing channel or if you're going to cut a marketing channel. So can you just share that rule you just shared with us? Cause it's such a common logical thing, but a lot of people, they, they, they play a losing game forever and they start running out of money. Right. So when we get into a marketing channel, um, the minimum time that we do it for, uh, that we have the ads running is three to four months. Three is like the bare minimum, but I like to kind of, I like to go about four months. Got into, it. Um, and we do it four months consistently. We don't change anything. We're not going to do 5,000 one month and 3,000 the other month. We're just going to do five, 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 or whatever the, the number is, whatever we decide you know, whatever the marketing budget is, we, we do that um, consistently for four months. And then we look at the numbers like every month or every other month. Um, but we really don't make a decision until the fourth month um, where if it's producing less than 3x. So, for example, if we put 10,000 in all together, we need to get minimum 30,000 in return. Um, and if it's producing less than 3x, um, we drop it. But if you it's drop it right away. We drop it right away. Yeah. After the three to four months. But if it's producing more than uh, 3x, if it's 4x, 5x, then we're just going to go ahead and put more money into that marketing channel and look for uh, more return. So, um, you know, market changes. I mean, so I've been in the business since 2016, like I said. So 
2016, 2017, all the way until 2018, my number one ba- my, my number one marketing channel was Bandit Signs. I did Bandit Signs religiously. Every week, we'd, we we got to a point where we would do Bandit, 500 Bandit Signs a week, right? So it was about 2,000 a month. We wrapped up the whole city with Sean buys houses, Sean, base, Sean pays cash, Bandit Signs everywhere. The city was after me. I had people, you know, it was, it was, it got pretty crazy where I changed the signs to Lucy buys houses. I yeah, we did that too. Alex, we, Alex started buying houses for us. I to Obama buy because Obama was president at that time. I changed to Obama buy. <laughs> 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 that kind of turned into a joke more than anything. I have more people calling me laughing about it than anything. So I changed it from Obama to back to, uh, changed to Sam. Um, but yeah, it was, just, it got, it got, um, but the, you know, regulations got more strict in Houston, you know, and rather than them picking the signs up from Monday I mean, uh, from yeah Monday through Friday, they started picking the signs up on, on the weekend. So we changed it. So what I'm getting to this is basically as time goes on, um, you know, your marketing channels need to change because, you know, like SMS was really good for us. RVM was really good, but regulations happen. Um, so you need to start changing marketing channels. So we always have minimum marketing. Minimum, we do about three marketing channels on, on a rotation. So right now we have four. We have radio. We have cold calling. Which been which has been like you know our forever. Uh, yeah, that'll community. never go away. <laughs> For some reason, I mean, I don't. We really don't like it, but it works, so we 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 like it. Um, uh, SEO and Google AdWords. Those are our four. You're not mailing. No, we're not mailing. Really? We don't have any success in mail? Really? That's in, I'm surprised just to hear that because that's our best channel in New York. Yeah. No, it's a lot of people's best channel, but I guess it just it just didn't work out for us. So, um, and which which. You know, it goes to think uh, it goes to the case as and there's like people say, what's the what's the what's the best marketing channel? I mean, all all of them work. It they just work. depends on what what works best for you and what you know what systems and processes you have for the each marketing channel. Maybe we didn't have the right system processes. Maybe we just didn't market enough. Maybe we didn't spend enough for like like we were talking off air. I was doing TV. I know TV is working for some people on Houston. I have a good friend of mine uh, who's doing TV um, in Houston. Houston and it's working yeah. for him. But I didn't, uh, so I talked to him after I stopped TV. But I was spending about fifteen thousand a month on TV, and he's like, "Dude, you're spending too little." He's spending forty five thousand a month. And I'm like, yes. Well, shit. I mean, I'm not. You know, I'd rather spend that on somewhere else. You know, I'd rather mix it up and and be yeah. able to have my marketing in different buckets. You know, right. So he's working for him. Um, but I mean, he's not getting like a five, six x return. He's getting like four, three, four. But I mean, spending a lot. So, um. So it really just depends on what you're, you know, what you're looking at, right? Inbound, outbound, all that good stuff. So that's yeah. kind of what, that's a little nutshell of uh, how we look at it. So you're running, you're running, uh, you know, a lot of good, uh, you know, the only one that isn't inbound is the, uh, the, the cold calling, right? So you're doing a lot of inbound marketing. So I'm assuming with that being said, your sales team is going to have a higher quality of leads to, to, to convert versus, you know, having to turn over a lot of jerk offs to get one, you know, golden exactly. swan, you know what I mean? So morale changes too in completely in the acquisition department, the morale changes. I mean, when we did SMS, RVM, uh, cold calling, those were like our top three for in like 2018, 2019, when they were just, RVM was like the new golden gem, the new thin gem that people didn't know about. Um, we made so much money off RVMs. It was so cheap, but um, it was just, you know, there's people calling and cussing you out. Like, why are you calling? And then we, we ended up like, Oh, we, we need to go ahead and get an IVR for the RVM. And we got an IVR and then, you know, people will, even though they'll press one that they want to sell their house, they'll still cuss. Oh well, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it, it, you know, we have a thick skin. You know, a lot of people, uh, business owners have a thick skin, or you, a lot of salespeople have a thick skin too. But some there's some that don't have a thick skin, so it it kind of. I I know I lost some sales guys as well just because they're like, yo, I don't like this. I thought we we're gonna be getting you know people who want to sell the house. I'm like, well, some do, but you gotta go through you know 40, 34, you know, thirty to forty no's to get a yes. So um, yeah. So that's just part of the process. So with your with your inbound marketing for the most part, now are you guys going on appointments or are you locking deals up over the phone? Because Houston is like a freaking jungle to get around. I've been there. It's so uh, dude. It's I got to get from one part of Houston to the it was like an hour and 20 minutes. And I'm like, holy shit, I'm trying to go fishing with my buddy Larry. It takes me an hour and 20 minutes to get to the damn boat. <laughs> yeah, you know, and there's so many different pockets. Like right now, I just dropped off my um, my dog to the groomers. He came to the office with us, a dog walks to the groomers, and it's in a nice area of, of Houston. It's called River Oaks. And then I had to go pick up something from another nice area in Houston. It's called West University. And they're literally like 10, 15 minutes apart, but I felt like I was in a different world from like River Oaks or West University. It's a whole different world, but that's how big Houston is. But um, no, we uh, lock up all of our properties over the phone. 
uh, over the phone, all of them over the phone, about 95% of them. There's that 5% where they want to see us or they want to come to the office. Uh, majority of the time we push them to come to the office rather than us going over there. Um, but there's some people like, well, I want you to see it. We're, like, we're going to see the property after we agree on price and terms. That's when we'll come out and check out the property. But uh, we don't want to, you know, send our field technician out there, you know, because we got to pay him to go out there to take pictures and videos. We don't, you know, we have a big, busy schedule as well. We're buying, you know, 10 to 15 properties a month. So we don't want to, you know, have him go out there without a uh, signed uh, agreement. I do the same. We do the same exact thing. Same exact thing. Unless, like you said, if it's a unicorn deal, like in San Diego, like I did this one in the house, it was like a six figure like assignment. And I'm like, all right, I'll go out and like my acquisitions got lived to Delaware. I'm like, yeah, I'll go out and sign the contract. Right. But like we went out to sign the contract. We didn't go out to try to get the house. You know, right, right, right. <laughs> we got the yes three times on the phone. Yeah. You know, yeah, that's, that's awesome. So you now your the question for you is, have you guys tried to like test this in another market? Because you're basically virtual in your own market, like because like Houston is competitive, even though it's good. Like, have you been like, well, if we're doing this in Houston, have you, have you tried to do it in another area or you guys have just tried to go so deep in your local market with the buyers and the knowledge of the market? Like, what have you, what are your thoughts on doing that? If you haven't done it before? Oh, it's great. I think it's great if you're trying to go for that model. I mean, so <clears throat> I've been in for years, right. And there's always the marketing is changing. The, the marketing is adapting. You got to adapt with the market yeah. before COVID uh, we uh, dabbled into Jacksonville, Florida. Got so it. we sold in Jacksonville, Florida. We got a few deals there. Uh, we sold one, and when it was time to sell the other ones that we got, COVID hit, right? It was like right during March of 2020, COVID hit. And, um, you know, our deals in Houston were still selling, but our deals in Jacksonville, Florida went dry. Like nobody was buying. They were buying only like 50, 60%, which we got it at. Because um, we were being really conservative in Jacksonville just because it was a new market. We didn't want to, you know, buy deals at 70, 75%. Because in Houston, that's where we're buying deals at 70, 75%, selling at 80, unless they're really good deals, we'll buy at 65, 70. But, you know, our, uh, our maximum allowable offer is like 70, 75% in Houston because we can sell it at 80, 85%. Yeah. Um, so, but Jacksonville, we're um, locking them up at 60, 65. We still couldn't sell them. So, um probably a month in after trying to sell these properties we're like hey we're just kind of wasting our time um you know we're trying to sell something trying to sell these properties in jacksonville with a lot of the buyers dried up let's just go really deep um <coughs> going narrow or rather than going wide let's just go really deep into houston so we went to really deep into houston and then i got the shiny object syndrome which a lot of entrepreneurs get uh where people started marketing the national model of yes dude that's the new thing bro so I got into the uh, national model last year. Um, uh, what was it? What was last? 21, 2021. Yeah. Like May, April of 2021, all the way until August. Um, so I tried it out. So what was that? Uh, April. Well, it's more than four months. I usually, I try everything out for four months, but I tried it out for like four or five months. It was cool. It was good. Um, we sold properties. We, we had, a, you know, we had like at least three to four X return. Um, but I just didn't see my business model. I, I just didn't see myself going like scaling that up because I didn't want to scale up because it just, I felt like it was going to create chaos, um, to my terms. I mean, as in, I know there's a lot of people who, who do it and, you know, they might not have create chaos, but I just didn't feel like we were in control of the deal. Mm -hmm. We're not in the same market. So we, the title companies were different unless we had a national title company, but they were just kind of we tried two national title companies. They were just really lagged. They weren't, we weren't getting title back for another two, three weeks, which in Houston, we get it back in five days. So that was a change. The, you know, showings, you know, we had people who went behind our backs, which we couldn't control. You yeah. know, it was, just, it was just a lot of things that we weren't in control of and we like to be in control. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, cause that's, you know, in, in the whole, and we didn't know the market, like as in, for example, there'll be, we closed about 10 deals and about in eight different States. Right. So the, all of the states had different regulations, different laws, different rules and yeah. different marketing. I mean, different uh, comps. Um, and it was just like a 50 percent dropout. Like it would be, you know, we got 10 properties and only four properties went through because six of them, we we thought we were good on numbers, but we weren't because it's in this side of town or it's in this part of the, the freeway or it's or in this part of whatever, wherever we're at. And I just felt like I was just creating chaos. So I talked to a mentor of mine I had at that time. He was like. I mean, you're in such in a huge, you're in like the biggest county in the U.S. I mean, you just, just go deep, just focus on it. Cause right now you're just like all over the place. And I was like, it's true. I'm all over the place. So 
Uh, we dropped it in August of 2021. And yeah. man, dude, I mean, we really turned up the notch. Um, I, I had, uh, we ended the, the la we ended last year, last quarter really strong. And then this quarter has been our best quarter that we ever had in the past six years uh, of being in business. And last month was our best month that we ever had in six years. So it really just goes into which focus really you know, your mindset changes. You don't really deal with the outside because there's so many different people, you know, selling different things and marketing different things like the national model or this and that. Um, but just go with what works. And, um, you know, if, if it wasn't for that mentor of mine, I, I would have just still, you know, just still doing it. there's a lot of, there's a lot of truth to that, man, because at the end of the day, like, you know, we do stuff in a couple different areas, um, but they're all relatively close, um, like regionally at least. And then California, I just happen to live here. So it makes sense when we have, you know, we don't do a ton of business out here, but when we do, their met profits are huge. So I found that with the, the national model from, from just looking into it and doing a little bit of testing, it, you, you trade one problem for another problem. You trade your high leads or high cost per lead for this kind of operational clusterfuck, to be honest with you, because you got like, like for example, like in, um, like in Delaware, like I know this as a fact, Delaware, there's 4% transfer tax, right? I would have never known that unless I started closing on deals in Delaware. Right. But then if you're like it used to Utah, like there's just, it, every state is so different with the laws and like, it's just a whole, it creates, it's possible and people do it very well. But if you have something really, really good, it's like the grass is not always greener, right? The yeah. grass is not always greener, especially in Harris County, dude. There's a billion people in Harris County. I mean, that's like, you said it's the biggest county in America, dude. What is it? There's literally, I think there's seven, pe seven million people in Harris County or something crazy, right? Yes, yeah, it's, it's crazy. I think it's like seven or eight million people. Yeah. It's, yeah. Um, we have Fort Bend County, which right next to us is pretty big as well as growing. But yeah, you nailed it. Um, you know, you trade in, for, you trade a problem for another problem, which you think, oh, I'm getting, you know, 30, 40, $50 a lead, which is great. You know, it seems good. You're getting, you know, 10, 15 properties under contract a week, which is, which is kind of chaotic as well. Because oh, it's, it's chaos. Dude, it's chaos. That's insane. You only move like five of them or six of them. You're just like, what the fuck? I thought, I thought the numbers were good. I, I mean, the numbers, right. But it just didn't, I mean, it just, I guess you just didn't know the market. And I feel like to be a really good investor, you know, I'm not going to say just wholesale because, you know, you know, you got to be a good investor as well. Um, I mean, to be a good investor, you got to know your numbers. You got to know your market. If you don't know your market, you know, it's just, you know, you just. Uh, you're it it just creates chaos. Yeah. Cause you're just, you're operating blind. Like Dan Kennedy would say, you're playing blind archery. You're just kind of going out and throwing stuff out there and seeing what's goes on. And you don't, like you said, you don't feel in control of your pipeline. You're not like, like the buyers too, like I've had, we've tested this too, man, like in Tennessee and stuff. And we've had deals, we've locked them up at decent numbers and the buyers over there are just really flaky. So we had buyers who would give us their word. We'd get them at the title company and then they'd flake out. And we're like, you know, we're spending all this time here on these deals. It's like, why don't we just go deep where we know? And like our profits are in, in New York are huge. Like we're making 35, 40 grand, a wholesale deal. We're not doing crazy volume, but like the numbers make sense. I'm like, why don't we just double down on this? You mentioned something offline. You get you got your your profits up to really really healthy uh, spreads, and you're in control of that, right? So, question for you on dispositions for people probably curious: when you get a deal locked up, when your when your team gets a deal locked up, are you doing a, a a straight up auction system where it's like you know you're sending it out, you're going to get a one time showing, it's going to go highest and best, and then your dispo person selects the best buyer, or do you guys kind of pick favorites from time to time depending on the deal? Highest and best. Highest and best, right? It's the way to go. The highest and best has to be someone, you know, like for example, if we have hundred and you know, if they like just a lot of our deals are going over asking. Houston. Oh yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. A lot of them go over asking. So let's just say we have a property market for one twenty, and we have you know two buyers at one thirty, right? Uh, if there's one buyer that's going hard money, and we have done business with them one time, and then there's another buyer that's at one thirty who's cash, and we've done business with them one time as well. I'm gonna go with the cash guy. Um, that's the only time we're doing favorites um or if there's someone that you know we haven't done business with or we haven't heard from at all and he's at 130 and the other guy's at 129 he's cash and we've done business with him, we'll do the 129 just to save that hassle 100 percent, especially with the biggest yeah, highest and best they just fill out a web form so it's not like a bidding war we don't tell um other buyers hey we have it for 129 can you do 130 I, I really like uh, stress that on my disposition agent that do not say what the price is. We just accept highest and best. And when we tell the buyers, Hey, we're, we're going to be accepting highest and best in the next 24 to 48 hours. 
when they say, hey, when are you going to accept an offer? Even if it's past 48 hours, another buyer comes over, we'll be accepting the highest and best in the next 24, 48 hours. Fill out our web form and just put your highest and best because we're getting a lot of competitive offers. 100%. Where we leave it at. I, I love that because it sets the stage for the buyers and then they're not pissed off or disappointed because they know they know what they're getting into. Because we, we do this in San Diego. We have it like down to a science. It's like put out a deal. They all know it's going to be a madhouse there. So yeah. what happens, 20% of the people just drop off. They say, I'm not doing this. I'm not going to fight for this deal. And then the 80% go in there and it's like World War II in the house. And then they're like, where do I need to be at? And we're like, no, 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 no. You're yeah, going to yeah. split your highest and best. Yeah. You're going to go into a spreadsheet. Yeah. We're going to review other, every offer. And then if you win, you win. And that's it. There's no, that's our game we're playing. And I think with, with wholesalers, a lot of wholesalers get a bad reputation because they basically like say one thing to one buyer and then they, they, they like tell the buyer thinks they're getting it. And then all of a sudden they don't, they don't communicate well. They don't under, they don't tell the buyers the process. Right. And when the buyers know in Houston or in New York or in San Diego, these crazy markets, when they know the process and they're willing to participate in the process, it just makes it to, it's like, it's like the MLS. It's just like the, it's the same exact thing, but it's not on the MLS, right? It's like, it just keeps the buyer's uh, expectations aligned. And then they put their best offer in, right? And then you're like, everyone's making more money and no one's pissed off. Yeah, that's very important. Just setting the expectations, letting them know, hey, what the process is. And like, hey, you're going to accept, you know, you're going to submit an offer through a web form. And on that, on, they have questions on, on the web form as in like, you know, hard money, cash, private money. Are you okay with sending $5,000 to title company or to us? You know, it's just whatever, you know, the, we have everything written down and they're required questions. So now we know where everybody's going to be at. But hey, let me ask you a question. Have you noticed, like, are you guys still doing a lot of showings or how is that working in, in, in your mind? Great market? question. That's a great question. So what we do, this is in a perfect world, right? Because it's never perfect. So yeah. in a perfect world, and even if the seller lives there, like, I don't go to the properties, but like I have people who will go there. So like, I'm not like emotionally tied in there that much. You know what I mean? So like, I'm not like in these showings. So what we normally do if, if the seller's okay with it is we tell the seller, if it's vacant, it's vacant. That's a totally different story. We tell the seller, the tenant, whoever, we just did this yesterday and we blew out this property way above, uh, <laughs> way above ask. So we say, listen, we're going to need to get inside for one hour on right. the day at this time. Right. We're going to take, there's going to be 15 people with us. Okay. So we're getting all of our, all of our due diligence, potential buyers. We tell them what's going on. We're very transparent with them. Uh, inspector, buyers, everyone's going one time, one place. It's going to be an absolute zoo here. It's going to be like a crazy town in here. There's going to be people running around the house. If you want to be there for it, you know, no problem. If you want to just step out, that's fine too. It's going to be craziness for an hour. Once that hour is over, we're, that's all. That's the only time we need to see it. Yeah. So the seller, we, same thing, expectations. They agree to that. When it's craziness at the house, they know that obviously yeah. was supposed to happen. And then after the showing, we tell the buyers, do not try to talk to the seller. Don't freaking try to sweetheart them. Sit there, look at the property, do what you got to do, take your contractor with you and get out. And when yeah. you're out of there, submit your highest and best. And that's it. So we like to do the one-time showing, create the competition, they all know they're competing for it, and that's it. Perfect. That's it. What about you guys? So we're doing the same thing. So what? What I just let side note: what the audience needs to get out of this show, if anything, is setting the expectation. We set the expectation with the yeah. seller, the buyers, our team, our sell, yeah, businesses, everybody. That's the most important thing. I just did a, the TikTok video on that, like I was talking to you. <laughs> setting the expectations is the biggest thing. I feel like if you set the expectations on every single thing that you do, you know, you'll be good. But anyways, um, long story short, we, um, so we do, we do this very similar thing. We do one-time showings. That's it. Um, if they can't make it, they're not getting the property either. Like we don't, yeah. we don't like wait for them. It's like, no, this time, this day, you can't go send someone on your team. We're not negotiating. Yeah. So, but our, I feel like Houston is such a competitive city. I feel like a lot of the buyers have been trained now and uh, been trained to give sight and scene offers. Interesting. Right? Okay. Even if we do, if we get a side and so let's just say our asking price is one thirty, and we get a side and scene offer of one thirty, we're still going to do the showing if we got a lot of interest in it. If we have a lot of like a lot of people calling and we got I asking, but what happens now is we'll get side and scenes offers for fifteen, ten, fifteen k over asking, because we have pictures and videos. So they're, and I've heard this from a lot of buyers as well. Like, hey, for us to compete in in this city and to compete with you know and to get deals from wholesalers. We got to just do sight unseen. They'll just drive by and they'll get sight. They're like, we're not going to wait for the showing because it's just properties don't last too long. So showings, we do showing probably out of 
five prop, or ten properties, we'll do two showings for two properties. The other, eight and most of them are sight unseen, gone. And they don't, they don't ever retrade because the the sight unseen thing. We've had that successfully and unsuccessfully. We'll have buyers who will go give us all the sight unseen thing, and then they'll like try to hammer us after we're in contract. And I'm like, dude, like, yeah. no. You know, yeah. you don't have that. You give a five thousand already. You give a five thousand dollar deposit already. And it's either you lose the five thousand, or I'll just get another buyer. I mean, this is a hot property, so it's either you get I, I get five thousand more than I was supposed to get, or you go <laughs> just keep going with it. So um, that's kind of where we're at. But even for us, even because we still buy properties, like if there's like a really good property that comes up, we have to get sight unseen. There's there's barely any showings. Yeah, and I've I've talked to other because I'm in some local masterminds. And that's what a lot of people say. They barely do showings now, just because it's just so competitive, and there's, there's such high demand and low low inventory that everybody's just yeah ready to go sign and scene. So it's nuts, bro. It's absolutely okay. nuts. So we, we, once in a while we'll do that, but a lot of the buyers, at least in New York, it, all the houses in New York are so different. Like all the inventory is so diverse up there. Like you got one house is like built in 1900, and the neighbor's house is built in 1950. So a lot of these people want to see it because there's, um, if it's an old property, it, it, it's not like the, the inventory is not homogenous, like in like Phoenix and Dallas and, and Vegas, like there's a lot of track home subdivisions. So when you go on Redfin, like you can get the ARV in literally 35 seconds. Like you just look at a house and you're like, this is what it's worth. New York yeah. takes a little bit more time yeah. because it's different. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you got, got a property in the Bronx and that way it took us, it, it was just. Oh, did you guys, you guys got a property in the Bronx? Yeah. We did, did it work out? Uh, we, we sold it, but the it seller did. ended up not wanting to leave because then she just had emotional attachment. She didn't know where to go, and yeah, she was just it was just a wreck. And I honestly think that she was someone was telling her in the back end like not to sell it to us and just yeah. to make it like she's backing out because I know she wanted to sell it in the beginning, but then she kind of like oh I don't want to sell. I'm like but you're behind in payments and you're behind in taxes. I'm yeah, like, like you're gonna lose this. And oh I'm just gonna figure it out. Here we go. Whatever, seller. Good thing we got 40 other houses to sell. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so are you guys taking anything down or you're doing all 100% assignments? No, we're taking things down. Uh, we'll do about 85% assignments. And okay. Or 15% we'll do hotels. Yeah. Uh, love it. Yeah, hotels. It just light rehabs. Anything under 20, 25,000. We don't have yeah. carry walls or anything like that. We're mainly just, you know, 10 to 15 is the magic number. So if we got to go 20, if it's a bigger house, we'll do 20, 25. You go, yeah, got to put a little bit more money. Something where we're just like replacing cabinets and countertops and bathrooms. We're not doing that. You're we're just doing the bathroom. updates, just the painting and floors. Yeah. Nothing and we, if we do countertops. We'll do countertops. We're not doing cabinets. We'll do yeah. countertops and, um, you know, vanities and things like that. The but, easy stuff, the stuff that people think is expensive, yeah. but it's really not. Yeah. Super easy stuff. Um, and then not really buying rentals as much anymore either, um, just because I'm my I'm kind of moving towards the commercial side. So I know when we talked last time, I was I was kind of looking at self storage facilities and whatnot. And I'm still looking at self storage, but I'm actually um, in the process of developing a um, office warehouse flex space. That's awesome, dude. Yeah, no way. About, uh, 1.5 acres in Houston, um, you know, near near major freeways. So me and my partner we're actually building that up. So gonna be about 20,000 square foot of warehouse, but there's gonna be, you know, split up into uh, 10 units and there are gonna be about 75% warehouse and 25% office for each unit. So it's flex space, basically. You do you build the flex space? Yep. That's awesome. Did you guys, uh, when do you guys anticipate that deal being done? So it's under construction. So probably about, uh, I would say January, somewhere between January and March. January, March. And then you're gonna do a refi, do a refi, get out of there and- Stabilize it. We're gonna do a refi, and then we're gonna go ahead and either keep it, or if we get an offer, we'll get an offer. Let's say. Dump, yeah, dump it if you get the right number, right? Make some big, make a big exit. That's the way to yeah, go. We we had it on the market too. We we have it on the market right now too. Just if we get a good number, and we will <laughs> dump it in and start over. <laughs> because it's shovel ready, you know. There's all that good stuff. So you know, before while we were getting all the permits and stuff, we even put it on the market just for the land trying to see if we sold it and we got some offers but i mean nothing that was like nothing that was like really enticing that was like oh we need to sell this now yeah that's awesome dude just every stage we just threw it on the market just to kind of see what we will get and see if we can uh you know make a really good exit without getting to construction but um, i really wanted to get into construction that was my partner's idea and i was like yeah that sounds like whatever an idea yeah so that's, that's where we're at good for you buddy 
So I want to wrap the show up in a, in a couple of minutes, but before we do that, now you're, you're in a competitive area. Houston is, is, uh, you know, there's obviously deals everywhere. There's abundance of deals, honestly. I mean, that's just, there's, that's just the facts. I mean, there's big dogs in Houston that are probably your friends, right? Same thing in San Diego, same thing in New York. A lot of the competition, at least I've realized most of the competition become your friends and you do deals with them. And we get investors bring us deals in our local market all the time. So it's like, the big markets are good because you can really like work together and, and help each other out. How often on a deal are, is your sales team competing with other offers on the table or are, are you guys pretty good at like, like how, cause it, for example, in New York, it happens all the damn time. I mean, yeah. in San Diego, it's the same shit. It's just, you're, you're fighting with people. You guys have that same thing in Houston or is it, is it? Not as much. Not as, not much. as much. It's crazy. I would think it would happen more than it usually does. But it doesn't. And I'm not really involved in the acquisition department as much anymore, but yeah. when I was, it would happen probably like once every other month. It would probably be some like, hey, we have some other offers on the table. Oh, from who? From X, Y, and Z. I've never heard of them. Don't know who yeah, there's just so many people there. There's some random people, but it's never like the big dogs or, I mean, what we're seeing more than we ever saw is just, you know, offer pad and offer, uh, offer up. That's they're, that's they're in Houston. They're, yeah, they're, yeah, they're buying, and they're buying a lot of Houston. Uh, and we can't compete with their offer. We're just like, hey, if you want to go, where you want to, you know, sell it to a large corporation, you know, they'll take down, uh, they'll take off, you know, I know they offered you 189, but they'll take off some price from that from for the repairs. They'll still pay 6% realtor commissions. They'll still pay 2% uh, closing costs. Um, if you want to go through that route, they're going to be your best offer. We, we definitely can't beat them on the offer. But if you want to go through local investors who, you know, will fix and flip your house and, uh, you know, you know, help you with the moving, help you, you know, even stay in the house after a day or two, or maybe even a week, or if you want to do a lease back, we can, we can help you. Yeah, we do that too. If you want to yeah. do that, you know, you can go with us. We have our office here. I'm not sure you need to have an office here, but, um, you know, if you want to go through a large corporation, you can go through them. And you'll you go through that them. dog and pony show. Yeah. Right. Like selling your house to fucking target or something, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's, that's funds. our biggest, I guess you can say, um, not competitor, but their biggest like name that we get, Oh, I got this from offer pad or what, because, you know, we're doing a lot of um, uh, inbound marketing, right? So yeah, SEO, uh, Google AdWords, a lot of those leads come. They also look at Zillow, not Zillow anymore, but OfferPad and OfferUp. They look at the big guys because they're advertising too. Are you guys seeing um, like the hedge funds? Uh, like th those are big, 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 like like just like the typical hedge fund buyers in your area. Or are you guys selling to them or is that not really going on in Houston that much? Because they're in the Southeast on. big. Yeah, that's going on. They're not as much. Um, but yeah, we'll sell some here and there, but, um, it really just depends on the property, but we don't, we're not really too big on the hedge fund, like selling to hedge funds. Just, I don't know why, to be honest. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of wholesalers in like, like South Carolina and Georgia, like they just rely on these funds and it's great. But you know, if that fund decides to change their model and they're selling 80% of their inventory to them, like, you know, you kind of ran out of a top customer. So yeah. highest and best has always worked for us. And, right. um, you know, it's just, it's just to wholesalers listening to this show right now at the end of the day when you're brand new and i say this to people all the time and it is a shameless plug but i don't really care if you're brand new and you're in houston you're way better off calling sean's company and jv'ing with them than you are trying to do it on your own at least in the first couple of deals because you will learn so much from that process or if you're in new york calling me or california i say this to new investors all the time and it's up to them i don't pressure them to, to do a deal with me they will most likely make more money splitting the profit with us than they would on their own. And they're increasing their chances of that deal converting, right? We do a lot of JV deals now from that because we bring the guarantee to the table and we can close if the thing falls. Like if it's a squirrely deal, we'll just buy it. Yeah. So do you guys, you guys see that in, in Houston where people bring you deals? Yes, people bring us deals. But, um, you know, that's same in the beginning, 2016, 2017, I found the top dogs, the top wholesalers, and I call them, I'll, I'll yep. ask them questions, I'll have lunch with them, I'll just, you know, try to get in their circle, because what they know at that time was like gold to me, right, so yep. people try to do it on, the, on their own, and you're going to get so far, um, but, you know, if you're in, new in the market, or if you're new in wholesaling, you know, find, you know, finding that person who's more experienced, you're going to get a lot more for your deal, and then again, you're also going to you know, learn so much. Like there's this property that we got in Killeen. Um, that's probably about three hours away from here, an hour away from Austin, right? Austin's a really, you know, crazy. Probably, I did a deal in Austin. It was insane. It was an yeah. insane competitive wholesale. Yeah. 
So we blasted the property at 120, right? And we got some buyers at, you know, 115, 110, and we got a buyer at 120. And then there was this experienced wholesaler came up um, to my disposition agent. and was like, hey, I can, I'll, I'm going to offer you 127. And um, my dispo, she doesn't really like working with other wholesalers just because in Houston, she's, she's like, hasn't seen that good of a rep. I, I'll tell you, so it was from New Western Acquisition, right? New Western yeah. Acquisition. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, so she was like, I'm going to go ahead. And she was like, I got a, I got 7K over asking, but I got this 120. He's an actual buyer. New Western needs an option. And uh, so she was kind of playing hard to get with New Western. They went, they came up to 135. They're like, hey, we'll give you 135. You have a really good property on your hand. You undervalued, you, uh, you undervalued it. You're like an hour away from like the hottest market in the United States. Give it to us for 135 and we'll go ahead and move it for you. And she told me, I was like, yo, let's just give him a chance. Let's just go ahead and give him a shot. Right. And they ended up selling it for like 150. Right? <laughs> I love it. Yeah. They ended up 150. So they give us more than what we we're asking for. And they still got some on top. So it, yeah. it was a win all across the board. So the point of it is like, you know, they were more experienced than us in that market. They brought the buyer. They, they knew, and it's just, it goes ahead. We collaborated rather than competing with them. Totally so this position is you can't compete with like the wholesalers are not our competition. They're, you know, they're, they're here to work with us. If it's someone reputable, like this, the the guy uh, from New Western, he just when he was talking to me, I just felt like he was experienced, and just the way his lingo was, I was like, I think he knows what he's talking about. One hundred percent. You know, if you find someone who's reputable, who's done it in the market, who's the, who's in that same market as you, or in the new market that you're trying to dabble into, then that's the best way to go. I uh, dude, I couldn't agree with you more on that, man. It's such a we, we had a wholesaler bring us a deal, and uh, he's brought us several deals. He brought us a house at a hundred. And he's like, let's try to sell this for as much, most, most amount of money possible. So he was, he was going to sell it for like 130 on his own, sold it for 170 with him, splitting. Wow. So like, we're, we're like, he's making more money with me and <laughs> I've got hundreds of deals under my belt. Yeah. So it's like, All day. it's just such a win-win for everyone. You know what I mean? That's a deal I didn't have to go out and market for. He is making more money and he's backed by our company and we have the funds to close if it needs to, you know what I mean? So it's just, there's just so many ways as a new wholesaler, especially in a market like Houston or New York or San Diego, where it's, it's really good to sell in partner up and you don't have to do this forever, do it for two, three deals. And even like if an investor, like us and I'll talk to someone for free just to help them. Cause I just, I like giving back. Right. Cause I was there, but like yeah. if another wholesaler is now bringing us deals, like, and I'm getting, let's say I get four phone calls. The first call I'm going to call back is the other guy who's already bringing value to the table. Just, just out of just, you know, just, and I'll call the other ones back too. But it's like, that's how a lot of these new investors can get their foot in the door with people who are doing big business by just bringing deals to the table. And it's just a simple thing, you know? Yeah. They say, they always say, where do we start? Find deals, go start driving for dollars, knocking on doors, you know, start talking to people and find deals. And once you find the deals, then, then start talking to other people. Like, hey, I got a deal. And you know, you know how many doors you open up? Once you find the oh, deal, man. that's where it starts. That's where you need to start at. Not, you know, LLC or you know, business card or whatever. Business cards. But, but for that model, and that's kind of what I regret when I started that national model. I mean, I don't regret it, but what we kind of, what the way we were taught, because, you know, I learned it from someone else. I didn't invent it or anything like that. I hired a coach and, you know, learned the, uh, the national model. Um, what we were taught was go to real estate agents to sell your deals which is cool, but I feel like the agents were just so lazy and they took so long. I'm like, yo, like I gave you this deal yesterday. Like, why do you have an answer for me today? Like, I needed an answer yesterday. But, 100%. You should have like, had it two hours. What's going on? Like, they were just so like, they lagged. I'm like, hey, you know, say you're going to talk to your buyer um, yesterday. I mean, you know, what's going on? Well, I haven't talked to them yet. I mean, it's um, end of day today. I mean, what's it? so they just took so long. So I would feel like it's whoever's, you know, listening to this and wants to go to the national model, I would rather go to experienced wholesalers to try to sell your deal rather than going to through agents. Um, you know, there's a little national model tip if you try. I 100% to agree. It's so much easier and, and you're going to tap into their market knowledge versus having to figure out on your own, you know, and, and like splitting profits when you're doing a lot of volume. It, it's like you, I've done a lot of those deals out of state, like in my prior days. And it's like, yeah, I was splitting some of the profits, but like, it wasn't, I wasn't doing anything. I was we're getting a deal. And then it's like, that's it. And if we closed on it, I'd send the cash. And if we didn't close on it, I'd get a check. Yep. I mean, it's like, I don't, I don't do anything. I yep. just like sit on the beach, you know, like whatever, <laughs> just hanging out, passive income, you know, yeah, for that's sure. funny. Well, listen, man, I want to wrap the show up. You, you always provide a lot of value. Every time you come on the show, you're doing some great stuff out there. 
the business is phenomenal. I'm really proud of you. And it's cool to see. So if people want to connect with you on social media, maybe they're in Houston, they want to do some deals with you, or they just want to follow you. What are the best ways for people to get in touch with you, man? Uh, Instagram and TikTok. So Instagram okay. is Sean Zavery, S-E-A-N, and Zavery, Z as in zebra, A-V-A-R-Y. So Sean Zavery on TikTok, Sean Zavery on uh, Instagram. And then you can also email me if you like, Sean at greenlightoffer.com. So Sean at greenlightoffer.com. I read my emails frequently. So if you have any questions, you got a deal, uh, or if you just want to, you know, just any questions at all, just hit me up. Love it. Sean, thanks so much for coming on the show today, buddy. Absolutely, Greg. I appreciate you, man. Good luck with everything.